Well, good morning. Welcome to the Aquarium Online Academy. My name's James. We're going to be talking about some very important animals today. Can you tell what we're going to be talking about? My friends that are joining us today. Yes! Not Kai and Jen. We can talk about them too. They're very helpful. Kai will be helping control all the fun pictures behind me here. Jen is going to be answering all your questions about octopus and friends. So, we're going to be having a lot of fun learning about the parts of the octopus, their adaptations, and then more about their cousins and relatives like the squid. So text us here at this number at the bottom of the screen, 562-286-1838, and you can help us find out what you want to know. That way, we can kind of guide it towards where you would like to have more information. Now, if your questions are really, really deep, or you want more information, or you're not watching live, you can still email us live at lbaop.org. You can email us some questions too. We'll have our educators answer them and get back to you as soon as we can. Well, let's get started talking about octopus. So this, unfortunately not an octopus. This is an octopus. But how would you know by looking at it that this is an octopus? Let's take a look at a real octopus and let's see if we can use our science brains because we're all scientists here this morning. We're going to make some observations about this lovely animal. What do you notice about the octopus? Hmm. I notice some colors. I notice some parts to their body. What else can you see? Or what questions do you have about what you see? So when we're all scientists, we make observations, we ask questions and investigate, and then we learn together. And we keep going. As you learn more, maybe you get more questions about it. So what did you see on the octopus? I see lots of suction cups. They have these tentacles, or arms in some cases they're called. They do have very technical names, but we generally just call them te tentacles on an octopus. How many do they have? <laughs> ah, they should have eight. Octo means eight, so an octopus should have eight arms. That's why a squid's not an octosquid, because they have a different number, and we'll find that out too. What about how they eat? How big they get? Those are good questions. We can get into some of that. Let's take a look at a video of one, give you an idea of how big they get. I'll step away just so we can take a little bit better look at an octopus in our exhibit. Now this is one of our previous octopus, I believe. This, I don't think this is our current one, but this is a giant Pacific octopus. You can watch as they move. Their suction cups are part of their body. Just like we have fingers that can move and we can count with each one, they can move each suction cup independently of each other. Could you imagine having a thousand fingers that you could individually count and move with? You'd be the best piano player ever. But an octopus is a little different. Each tentacle can move on its own and each suction cup can move separate from another. So they are really, really what we call dexterous or high dexterity. They can move a lot of stuff independently. Now the cool thing about these tentacles is that inside each tentacle, sometimes people call it a mini brain. The science word for that is a ganglion. It's a bundle of nerves that is big enough that it can kind of create signals straight from the ganglion to the tentacle rather than going to our brains. Now we have something similar in our spine. We have signals come into our spine and it'll immediately come back out. Have you ever stubbed your toe or you jerk your finger back real fast? That signal didn't always hit all the way up to your brain and go back down. It's much faster to go to a central part of your nervous system and the signal goes back out. Now when we choose to control our body on our own, that goes up to our brain. But those immediate reflexes may not go all the way to the brain. So our bodies have some interesting adaptations just like theirs do. Now Susie has a great question. Octopuses are your favorite, oh that wasn't a question, Alan's question was next. Susie, maybe you do have a question, they're your favorite, so what else would you like to learn Susie? I love that they're your favorite because I love octopus too. Now, Alan's been tuning in this morning. Good morning, Alan. How do the suction cups stick and how do the octopus change color? Well, Alan, I'm glad you asked because I was wondering when I'd ever get to use this tool right here. 
Don't worry, this is clean. It was never used for what you think it was. Suction cups are special because the, the way that we've designed them, we probably took the idea from nature, is that the air gets trapped underneath. Now, you can do the same thing with water. If you stuck this to something underwater, it creates a vacuum effect. Now, for this, it's just because we stuck it to something. For an octopus, it's the muscles in their body that are creating the suction. And then, have you ever tried to pull one of these suction cups off? You can squeeze it, and it breaks the seal. So when you're watching them move around with their suction cups, you can see each suction cup is kind of changing shape. So they're using some suction power. Now, scientists are always learning about how things move and walk around, because even though we know a lot, we don't know everything yet, we could discover new amazing things about how suction cups on an octopus really work. So keep watching. I'm going to read off another one of our questions. Keep watching those little suction cups and see if you can see the change in shape as an octopus moves. Now, this question is a lovely question. I like it when people ask this question because it's part of our cultural history. So if you ever heard the book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, there's this giant octopus monster in there. They don't actually make that noise as far as I know, but they're also not quite that big. The giant squid or octopus that you often see in movies and TV, like in the book or the movie 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, is an enormous animal to a scale that doesn't quite exist. However, the giant Pacific octopus does get big. Their tentacles can stretch as wide as about 10 to 15 feet for like a normal one. They might get even bigger for the really big giant Pacific octopus, like the biggest that we're ever recording. And their weight can overpass 40 to 50 pounds. The big one here might get up to 40 pounds. I think the record for giant Pacific octopus was around 100 pounds. That's a pretty big octopus, but not big enough to sink a large sailing vessel. Take a look at one of our current octopus. This is Godzilla. I think that's also the best name for an octopus. Now Godzilla has a brand new exhibit space that was recently remodeled just so we could make the octopus experience even better. So we designed it specifically because they like caves and spaces under the water. Now if you watched our how to build a habitat for an octopus, we learned that there's a special plexi window space over here so the octopus feels like it's in a cave but it's not because it's see-through and that makes it feel comfortable and it doesn't mind being out and around in front of people sometimes now lizzie and evelyn were curious about how would we ever find out the gender or the age of an octopus that's a different kind of way to investigate because with some animals there's a very easy way to tell the difference between male and female other animals, it's a little bit tougher, or you have, really have to know what to look for. With squid, the size of the tentacles are one way we can do it. With an octopus, it's a very similar thing, because the males have a, one tentacle that's a little bit different size and shape than the rest compared to the females, and that's because of how they try to have babies. So they do a different kind of fertilization. The male has to hand off the reproductive cells, the sperm, to the female and the female will then use them to fertilize the eggs. So I kind of describe it like a football handoff, and that's kind of what it is, but it's a very quick interaction. It's not like other animals that might have a little bit more dancing and flirting like birds do. The octopus is more like, I have really great colors, that means I'm an important and healthy animal, and we could try to have babies. It's a very fast interaction. So it's a little bit different than what you think birds or mammals doing. But good questions, Lizzie and Evelyn. Now. Let's take a look at some other adaptations octopus have. Now, I'm thinking of how they hide. Do you know what that big fancy science word is when animals can hide and look like the environment? Camouflage, yes. It's also a great Scrabble word. Let's take a look at some camouflage. Now, here's an octopus hanging out and suddenly it changes color and texture. That is why octopus, I think, are one of the coolest animals in the ocean. Because not only can they change colors, but the octopus skin is very flexible, and they have a lot of control over their skin, and they can change the texture. Do we ever change the texture of our skin? What happens when you get suddenly cold? Get the chills? The little hairs might stand up. You have little muscles in your skin that make your hair stand up. Well, imagine you could control them and make shapes with them, too. That would be so cool. That's what an octopus can do. They can change the shape of their skin and the coloring in their skin. 
Now we have a close-up of what these cells look like. These are called chromatophores. Chromatophores are little windows that allow you to look into the pigment in them. So you can see all of them changing size and opening and closing, and that's how you can see that effect. When they have them all open, you can see one color, and then you can close them so you can't see those colors. Now they're filled with a pigment. Sorry, my mic was working before, and now it wants to fall off my face. Now, they have a pigment inside, and it's not like they're making new pigment every time this happens. They're just allowing you to open the window, or their skin opens the window so you can see those colors. Now, some squid have really specialized color changing, and so do cuttlefish, some of their cousins. But the octopus is one of the ones that can do probably the most amount of color change and skin texture change. Now, this is a cuttlefish. I love the cuttlefish. They are a very interesting animal. Here's one of the giant ones. Now, when we say giant, we're also not getting to the scale of 20,000 leagues under the sea. I think the giant cuttlefish gets... This is about 20, 24 inches. I think that's as big as a giant cuttlefish gets. It's not a big animal compared to a giant Pacific octopus or even a giant squid. The giant squid does get pretty long. Their body with tentacles and all could be as long as 60, 70 feet. So the giant squid is a large animal, but most of the body length is in those tentacles. The colossal squid is a similar, very large deep ocean animal, but their main body is bigger. So if you compared one to the other, if this was our giant squid, the colossal squid would have, squid would have much shorter tentacles, but a much bigger body. So there's a lot of diversity in variety in the octopus, squid, cuttlefish, and nautilus group. We call them the cephalopods. So these are all those different animals, and they all share some of these adaptations or abilities to survive, like suction cups, color changing, although the nautilus doesn't change much in color, but it does have some other special adaptations we can get into also. So here's the nautilus. You might have recognized the shell, but the body looks a little bit different. They have even more different tentacles that they use to help grab their food. And when they swim, it's kind of fun to watch because it's not like an octopus moving or a squid swimming because squid actually have fins on their body. Let me pick up my squid friend real quick. So the squid or, uh, fins help them as they move. So I'm going to step out of the way so you can see this. This is how a lot of the cephalopods move. They suck water in to this cavity in their body and then they squirt the water out through what we call a siphon. Now we can take a look at this at a, or on a real cephalopod look at what their siphon's doing. So you can tell it's blowing water out one and pulling water in here. So it pulls water into this part and then it blows water out the siphon. You can almost imagine that it's making snoring noises right now, but they don't snore. So here's a great video. So here's the water going into the mantle cavity and then coming out of the siphon. An octopus actually can move the siphon around. So the siphon on this one's sticking out one side. They can actually tuck it in and around and stick it out the other way. A squid, it doesn't work that way. A squid siphon, it, oh, here we go. Squid siphon only points one direction. Their body kind of has to stay this elongated shape because they have a rigid part of their back called the pen. And the pen helps keep them in that shape while they're underwater. Whereas an octopus doesn't have that and can fit into anything its mouth can fit into. Now I have uh, a squid slash octopus beak. Let me show you. The beak, now this would come from probably a very large giant Pacific octopus or possibly a pretty good sized squid. This could be from a Humboldt squid, which actually are about human size. But let's take a look at this under our document camera. Yeah, actually, here's a picture of a Humboldt squid with a diver. Humboldt squid get at least six feet long, and they're pretty big squid. They're very, very cool animals. But they can be very scary sometimes, animals. But that's okay. Things in the ocean can be scary. But let's take a look at the beak on our document camera. Now, the beak has the shape of a bird beak. Let's turn the light on. There we go. So you can see kind of why... It gets the name of a beak. Now let's change the lighting so we can see a little bit better. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to do this. 
Let's try, yeah, we're playing with the lights because this coloring is a little bit different than what we normally show under our document camera. But you can see kind of why they get the nickname of a bird's beak. But this is a very powerful jaw that can grab their food. Here, let's do this. They can grab their food and break open their food. So if you had food that needed this powerful of a jaw to break through, what do you think would be eating? Now, when we think of a parrot or a bird, their beak is good for breaking open seeds. Not all parrots do that, but a lot of parrots will eat seeds or hard materials, hard fruits sometimes. But what if you're an animal in the ocean? What kind of hard things would you have to break open? Are you thinking of shells? Yes! Actually, an animal with a shell might be something like these. These are abalone. I'm going to put them under the camera too so we can take a little bit closer look. Now, octopus will eat lots of things off the sea floor. A squid might catch things out in the open water, but if you have a shell, you're going to have a lot of protection on your body. Now, a squid has a very strong, powerful beak. They can break through crab shells. They can break through clam shells. Let's see if I have a clam shell available. Here we go. Clams and cousins. Here we go. Clam. Let me turn the lights on because now the clam is a light color, whereas that beak was a dark color. This is a scallop shell. So if you're an animal with a shell, you have armor. Really good against a lot of animals, but the octopus is a lot better at breaking this open. Not only are their tentacles very strong and able to pull things apart, but their beak is able to crush and break through some of these shells. Uh, I also have a crab exoskeleton right here. Now, crabs molt, so this, is, this came from a crab leaving this behind. But this crab shell, when it's normally in the ocean, would be a very tough shell to get through for most animals, but not the octopus. The octopus can grab and break through them. We actually feed our octopus whole thawed out crab. It's a frozen crab, and then we, we'll thaw it out and we'll give it back to them. Now, this one's kind of delicate because it's a molt, so I'm going to put this back down. So, an octopus and squid and other animals, they have these very powerful, very strong beaks. But let's take a look at what it looks like when they catch their food. So their cousin, the nautilus, or not the nautilus, the cuttlefish, is catch their food. Now, if you have that little shrimp, you're not going to have a good day. But if you're a cuttlefish, it's lunch. Look at the, <laughs> this crab has figured it out. It's like, no, 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 I don't want to play this game with you. I'm going to hide. But then the cuttlefish says, ooh, look at the pretty light show. And they have really, really quick reflexes for color changing too. That's really, really fast. The cuttlefish can do this light show with part of their tentacles sticking out, and it will kind of confuse or mesmerize their prey. And then suddenly like, oh, ooh, uh, and they grab it really fast with their tentacles. So a squid has a little bit different body than an octopus does. And I gotta hold this way up because the tentacles are a little bit different like. So here they have arms and tentacles. Now, the cool difference is the arm has suction cups all the way up the length, so the arms are shorter on a squid. The tentacle is the long one with the, almost like a club-like end, and the cuttlefish has this too, where they can reach out, grab their food, and grab it in. So their tentacles look very different than what we consider an octopus tentacle to be. So in reality, the octopus has arms, but we call them generically tentacles. And that's okay. We have lots of common words for parts of these animals that kind of change depending on the definition for who they are. But in some cases, we just have a generic name so that we can colloquially or commonly call them something that we all understand. All right. We had another question come in. Are octopus normally active or do they sleep a lot? It looks like they should be sleeping a lot. They like to hide in the rocks, right? Well, let's go back to our video of Godzilla and let's talk about what does an octopus do during the day? For some of our octopus, they are super active. They like to hang out on the window. They like to play, be very out front of, with the people. But in general, they're nighttime animals. So we call that nocturnal. Nocturnal means active at night. If you're diurnal, you're active during the day.
So here's a diver that found an octopus hiding, and an octopus is like, oh no, you weren't supposed to see that. So they can, let's watch the siphon on that too, because that's kind of the cool part, is the siphon very quickly helps it scurry away. They almost crawl slash swim. So their bodies are designed to hide. And this one, it, it gets found and it's gonna do three things. It's gonna be like, I'm gonna squeeze in this space, I'm gonna do color changing, and I'm gonna ink too. So the ink is kind of a goopy mixture. It's a, uh, was it some mucus type that's made of proteins. And that mucus is going to get all gummy and kind of stick to their potential predators. I don't know about you, but if you wanted to escape, if you threw a giant ball of mucus at something, that would probably get them to stop. It's a very good adaptation. You could try it, but that's a lot of mucus for you to make, so... You know, it's tougher for us. But their, their ink is kind of this, not just watery mixture, but they mix it with mucus, and then it can stick to their predators, and there's like, oh, that, I don't need that. But also they can just kind of be like ocean ninjas, and like, boom, smoke bomb, hide. So they can get away from a potential predator if the color changing, if the hiding in the cracks and crevices isn't working. But then that siphon helps them also rocket backwards, get away from a potential predator. Now, one of the questions we get about our octopus in our exhibit is why is it by itself? Why do you think we wouldn't put any other octopus in that exhibit? We love our animals here and we take very good care of them. So why would that octopus not have any octopus buddies? They like to be alone. They are very territorial for most species, and they really don't want to hang out with any other kinds of octopus. So we don't put other kinds in there because they would not be happy with each other. Now, there is a type that we have here called the big eye octopus, like big eyes, because it has pretty large eyeballs, and they will be in groups. There's also a few other species of octopus that you might see in groups out in the ocean. But for the most part, octopus like to be by themselves. Now, this is a little bit different for squid. You'll see squid congregating together in big areas. We'll actually put a number of squid together in an exhibit like the big fin reef squid, but also during their mating season, there's a lot of squid that hang out together. For an octopus, it's a little bit different during mating season. They have to try and find a mate across a vast space where there's not a lot of octopus to be found. So even among all the cephalopods, they have different behaviors and different preferences of how they're going to be living in their habitat. Now the nautilus does hang out in groups, and I think the cuttlefish will be kind of grouping sometimes alone. The cuttlefish also have some very fun ways to communicate with each other, just like squid do, and some of it is with that color changing ability. So we'll use, our nautilus can't color change. So the nautilus are really fun, but they're deep sea animals. If you live in a deep dark ocean, do you need a lot of color changing? Probably not, unless you wanna go from like darker red to less dark red, or black to black or black. In the deep ocean, color changing is not as important as it is where you're visible up in the surface waters. So they don't change colors. They don't swim nearly as fast as the, as the squid or a cuttlefish do. And they can communicate by changing colors on different parts of the body. Different colors mean different signals. And then the nautilus, remember we say we, how they swim. So if you look at their body, the squid will rock it backwards. The nautilus kind of does this rocking effect. And they have a little siphon in here. You can almost see it under there and they get a little bit of water in they just kind of do this rocking effect is that the only direction they can go well they can't really swim that way so this one it can only go backwards that's actually forwards backwards is that way so they can only go backwards and the other thing is they can change their vertical space by diving or surfacing the cool part and i have a nautilus shell we can show the cool part is that the chambers in their shell they can fill with water. So this is exactly what you see on the screen. This is a Nautilus shell. Ooh. And inside, you may have seen patterns like this before. These are all different chambers that they can fill up. Let's go over the document camera because we should take a little bit closer look at this. 
The octopus can change where it is at by diving, but the Nautilus does it differently. Let's turn the lights up on our shell a little bit. That's pretty good. Now, if we zoom in, we can see that this is a spiral and each chamber as it grows bigger and bigger gets closed off. So another layer will get closed off as this uh, shelled animal will get bigger and bigger. But as they get bigger, they can also add water to some of these chambers to help them sink. Now we figured out how to do this with submarines. It's called a ballast tank. Even the ships that take stuff across the ocean, like container ships, they use ballast tanks to help balance the ship, but also have it ride higher or lower in the water. But a Nautilus can do this in a very special way. They can dive two to 3,000 feet during the daytime to get away from the light, and then they can surface those two to 3,000 feet during the nighttime to go find food. Ah, Susie asked a good question right on topic. Are there any octopus or cephalopods in the midnight zone? Do you remember your zones of the ocean sea? The top is the epipelagic, then the mesopelagic, then the bathopelagic, and then the hadopelagic. It gets really dark after the very top one, the epipelagic. So all the other zones are really dark. After about 200 meters, 99% of light has been absorbed, so it gets pretty dark. There are a lot of cephalopods. Squid, octopus, cuttlefish, and did I get them all? Squid, octopus, cuttlefish, nautilus. Nautilus. I just talked about them. They like to be in the dark. This is the bobtail from a picture from the Noceanos, uh, Noah Okeanos Explorer. There's a number of these squishy animals, the mollusks, that are these cephalopods that live in the deep ocean. One of the cool things that when we were watching a live feed from the Noah vessel nautilus, is that they found a bunch of squid feeding on other things. Now, there was a, what we call a whale fall. So a whale had passed away, and it sank to the bottom of the sea. And other things find it, and they start consuming those parts of the whale. And things like bobtail squid might be down there. But the, thing that was, the, the squid that was on that whale, we don't know the exact type of squid. But there were a lot of them, and they were feeding on all the little crustaceans that were scavenging on that dead whale. So there's a lot of cool creatures in the midnight zone in the really deep parts of the ocean Susie and we keep finding new types all the time this bobtail squid I think was uh, either discovered or classified maybe 10 years ago at most so it's been seen a few times but then scientists have to have a group of them figure out is this a new one or is this just a little bit different from another one we know and then once they agree that yep this is an all brand new animal they can figure out what to name it, and they can add it to our list of animals that live in the deep ocean. So it takes a while to name some new animals. And so that's why you might see these things like, oh, this was first filmed 10 years ago. But it's because it takes a while to find out it's a new animal that we haven't named before. Now, Kai has something special to show us. Here's a little octopus. This one's from NOAA, or National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Now, this is a deep ocean octopus. What do you th see as a difference from our giant Pacific octopus that was hanging out up in the light? The kind of cool thing is you can almost see through part of this octopus right here. Now, it's also just kind of, its standard color is kind of this white pale color instead of that nice bright red we saw on our giant Pacific octopus. So there's a lot of things. Oh, they're going to zoom in. Hold on. I didn't realize they're zooming in. <laughs> they have really high definition cameras. And sometimes it takes a little while for them to find some of these things. But also sometimes they have to go take the ROV or the little remote vehicle back to where they found something and try and refilm it. Uh, now, I don't know if this is on hell or Angel. The Angel's dad is asking, did sailors use octopus ink for writing? I think you can. I don't know if they commonly used it because you could use a lot of other things to mix together to make ink. So ink way back in those days, they might use, they might burn something and take the carbon from that. They might use other chemicals to make ink, but you could use it to write with. It's just not very thick, so it wouldn't come out very, very easy to see. But good question about 
octopus ink. That's kind of where we get the idea of ink in our brains from, is that, oh, we must have copied nature. People have been using plants and other things to write and color with for a long period of time, before we probably knew what an octopus was. But we use the same things we know on land to name things in the ocean, which is why there's a lot of fish with land animal names, like the fox-faced rabbit fish. That has two other land animal names in its name. So we use a lot of common things we know from land to name creatures in the ocean. Uh, now, Jen added this part of information, the, the Jiotaku process where they would make a print of an animal they caught. So they would catch an animal and part of the culture would be to put ink or paint or something on it and then they press it to a linen or a fabric or now we use paper and they could kind of create that animal on that surface. But they would use octopus ink apparently, which is kind of cool because you would use all the parts you could to create that art or have that uh, a semblance of that animal. Uh, Jen apparently has, with actual octopus ink, oh, okay, so Jen has a Jiotaku print at home with squid ink. So if you catch a squid, you could collect some of the ink and try to make a Jiotaku with it. Susie asked another question, do all octopus change colors? Yeah, they do. That's a common characteristic across a lot of the cephalopods. Remember, the nautilus doesn't, but all the octopus, the squid do, and the cuttlefish do color changing too. Oh, Alan was asking about the, the big eye octopus. They do like to be in groups. I don't know how many the big eye octopus can be together. We've had, I think, four or five in one of our exhibits here before. Now, there's some octopus that they will be in large groups all across the seafloor. Now, the big eye, I don't know if it's that one particular, but there are some octopus that will kind of colonize and be together. But they have, like, their one space. Like, you can't get close too close to me. Like, they're doing their own social distancing without realizing it. Well, there are a few kinds of octopus that like to be in big groups. Great question. All right, well, we have run out of time. I got so sidetracked talking about all the cool things that octopus and their relatives do. Thank you so much for participating with us today. We have more fun this afternoon. We're going to be talking about more deep ocean stuff. So, Susie, if you're interested, our 1 o'clock program is going to be talking all about deep sea animals and bioluminescence. And at 2 o'clock, what's our 2 o'clock program? Sharks! If you love sharks, tune in for our 2 o'clock program, too. So thank you everybody for hanging out and learning a lot about octopus and friends here in our Aquarium Online Academy. We'll see you at one o'clock for deep sea animals and bioluminescence.